182 centimeters or 6 feet was likely attainable. For Neanderthal weight, samples of 26 specimens found an average of 77.6 kilograms or 171 pounds for males, 66.4 kilograms or 146 pounds for females. The body mass index for Neanderthal males was calculated to be 26.9 to 28.2 which in modern humans correlates to being overweight. Though Neanderthals were literally big boned, their bones were thicker and denser than modern humans. These bones likely result from a combination of naturally thick bones and a very active lifestyle. Neanderthals also had more muscle mass than the average modern human. Overall, they were about 15% heavier than the average modern human despite the fact that they were shorter. One of the most famous Neanderthal individuals Lafrazi 1 was only 1.6 meters or 5 foot 2 inches tall, but he weighed an estimated 85 kilograms or 190 pounds. This individual was undoubtedly very strong in his lifetime, though people tend to over exaggerate their strength. Modern athletes and powerlifters who regularly exercise reach similar, if not higher, levels of strength. Their morphology has caused many different hypotheses regarding its function. The most common explanation has been that they were adapted to glacial conditions. The Neanderthals experienced at least four separate glacial periods. These periods would have been very hard to survive in Central Europe. Europe is already cold in the modern day, but it would have been much colder during these periods. The idea is that Neanderthal morphology evolved to be shorter and squatter to survive these freezing conditions. It comes down to simple physics. Less surface area means less heat lost. This correlates with populations of modern humans living in Arctic conditions. They have also evolved shorter limbs and squatter bodies. The problem with this thought process is that Neanderthals living in warmer conditions in the Mediterranean and the Middle East also retained this squat morphology. And to add to this, during interglacial periods, Europe would have been quite warm. Alternate hypotheses have also been proposed. In 2019, English anthropologist John Stewart suggested that Neanderthals were adapted for sprinting. Their robust bodies may have allowed them to quickly run after prey. DNA analysis also indicates a higher proportion of fast twitch muscle fibers in Neanderthals than modern humans. He explained their body proportions and greater muscle mass as adaptations to sprinting as opposed to the endurance-oriented modern human physique. They had longer heel bones than modern humans, which means they also had a longer Achilles tendon. The longer Achilles tendon would have been less efficient at storing energy for long-distance running and more suited towards sprinting. Their shorter limbs were certainly not useful for hiking, but they were for staying warm and for sprinting. Both the hyperarctic hypothesis and the sprinting hypothesis are likely true in their own ways. It is undeniable that Neanderthals lived through some very cold conditions and their morphology couldn't help but be affected by this. For example, the Neanderthal LEPR gene concerned with storing fat and body heat production is similar to that of the woolly mammoth. It was almost certainly an adaptation for a cold climate. Other aspects of their morphology, such as their heel length and fast twitch muscle proportions, suggest that sprinting was a part of how they were shaped. Or the salad with extra dressing on Uber Eats. Show the Kardashians and Uber Eats. Another aspect about Neanderthal morphology that has long been debated is whether their humori allowed them to throw efficiently. Original evidence seemed to indicate that their shoulders could not overarm throw well. Though additional studies and physical evidence now highly suggest that they could throw. Berthalm et al. 2014 found that Neanderthal humori were both efficient at thrusting and throwing. There was no evidence that thrusting was more prominent. It also found that sapien and Neanderthal humori, although different, showed similarities in resisting throwing and thrusting stresses. At a site in northern France, Neanderthal arm bones have micro and macro traumas associated with habitual spear throwing. The discovery of the Shonen spears also provided physical evidence that spears may have been being thrown in Europe even by the ancestors of classic Neanderthals. 
They were certainly able to throw, and evidence suggests that they did, though their shoulder mechanics are not the best for overarm throwing. Many other small features about Neanderthal bodies differed from our own. The distal digit of their thumb was longer than modern humans. This would have provided them with a comparatively wider and stronger grip. Their rib cages were wider and barrel shaped. They had longer and straighter ribs that may have provided them with room for a larger diaphragm and possibly a greater lung capacity. Moving up from the body, their skulls contained many interesting differences. When looking at a Neanderthal up close, the first thing you might notice is their large brow. This brow was useful at protecting their face and eyes against heavy blows from animals, rock falls, and other environmental hazards. You may notice their large eyes, larger than any modern human you have met. Along with these eyes, they also had a bump on the back of their skull called the occipital bump. This feature may be responsible for a number of purposes, but one of them may have been to make room for the larger occipital lobe in Neanderthals. The occipital lobe is responsible for visual perception. Their large eyes in conjunction with their large occipital lobes would have given them better vision, especially in low light conditions. This may have considerably helped them hunt during dawn or dusk. They also had large sinuses and olfactory bulbs, which would have provided them with a good sense of smell. Sometimes they are depicted with very large noses, but in reality their noses would have been similar in size to modern humans, though their sinuses were nearly a third larger than living populations. They would have been able to take in almost twice as much air as modern humans through their noses. Their sinuses may have also been used to warm up air before it entered their lungs. In fact, their sinuses show some similarities with modern arctic populations. Another part of their appearance which may seem strange is their lack of a chin. We perceive a chin to be a normal part of a human face, when in fact, we are the oddballs for having them. Every other species of hominin and primate lack a chin, because chins are pointless. They do not help with chewing or anything mechanical, they are purely for show. Some believe that they developed as our species became increasingly social and less aggressive. This process of self-domestication may have decreased testosterone levels in males and created our modern facial structure. We do not know for sure what the role of a chin was, but we know that Neanderthals didn't have them. But without a chin, their actual jaws were quite large. They had shovel-shaped incisors and large molars. Their molars also differed from modern humans in that they had an enlarged pulp. Infant Neanderthals also got their teeth up to four months earlier than modern humans. This would have allowed them to eat solid food significantly earlier. The last feature of the Neanderthal skull that you would notice quite easily is their sloped back, flat skull. Unlike modern humans, which have a globular skull, Neanderthals had a flatter, elongated skull. This skull, of course, housed their large brain. Male Neanderthals averaged a brain size of 1,640 cubic centimeters, while females averaged 1,460 cubic centimeters. In comparison, modern European males averaged 1,360 cubic centimeters, while females averaged 1,200 cubic centimeters. The largest Neanderthal brain case, AMUD1, had a brain size of 1,736 cubic centimeters. At face value, it seems that Neanderthals had significantly larger brains than our species, but it is more complicated than that. Brains were very large, um, but they actually weren't as, as large as some people actually portray them to be. So they're frequently described as being the largest in terms of cubic centimeters in the, the hominin lineage, but brain size is actually related to, to body size. Whales have much bigger brains than we do, but they also have bigger bodies. And so if you control brain size to body size with Neanderthals, and this is usually done by looking at the size of the orbit of the eye, which doesn't, uh, which, which reflects body size more so than, than the rest of the, the cranium, um, like Neanderthals are a little bit less big in brains relative to body size than, than modern humans are. So they're not the brainiest of the modern, of of uh, the hominins, but then again, there are many humans alive today who have smaller brains than by body size than Neanderthals, so they're within the range of modern humans. Besides overall size, 
The organization of a brain is another very important aspect to its function. Endocasts of their brain have shown that they had smaller parietal lobes and a smaller cerebellum. Both of these areas of the brain are very important for a number of things, including creativity, muscle memory, language, and social abilities. This does not mean that all Neanderthals were necessarily less intelligent in these areas, but it does mean that there were differences. The temporal lobe is associated with processing language, pattern recognition, perception, and memory acquisition. As mentioned earlier, they had larger occipital lobes and olfactory bulbs. These structures are responsible for seeing and hearing, among other things. Compared to modern humans, How do we know which side of the brain, the brain, the brain was devoted to visual and somatic systems. This left less neural tissue over for other areas of the brain in Neanderthals. Homo nice. sapiens, on the other hand, have smaller than expected visual areas for a primate of our size. Therefore, it wasn't that Neanderthals had abnormally large eyes and visual cortex, but that Homo sapiens actually have abnormally small visual systems. This seems to have left sapiens with more neural tissue to devote to other regions of the brain. Neanderthal skulls show different rates of brain growth, with individuals reaching maturity faster than in modern humans. It would have taken a Neanderthal around 15 years to reach adulthood. That is nearly a decade earlier than it takes modern humans to reach adulthood. The brains of Neanderthals are not comparable to any modern human. The differences they had are undoubtedly responsible for the different traits that they left in the fossil record. It is easy to focus on all the similarities that Neanderthals had with modern humans, but we cannot let them overshadow the fact that they were different. Well, another way that Neanderthals were similar to our species is that they had a range of skin, hair, and eye colors. This is due to the fact that they occupied a wide geographic range. A Neanderthal from France would have looked quite different than one from the Middle East. Even Neanderthals in the same populations would have had varied appearances just like modern Europeans. However, we must be careful in assuming that if modern humans living in a region had light skin, then Neanderthals that once lived there had light skin too. DNA analysis from the three Neanderthal females from southeastern Europe indicates that they had brown eyes, a dark skin color, with two of them having brown hair and one of them having red hair. Other Neanderthal populations living in the Middle East and even in Siberia had dark skin, eyes, and hair. Even though lighter skin is more frequent at higher latitudes in modern Homo sapiens, the same wasn't necessarily true for other human species. Both the Neanderthals and Denisovans living in the Altai Mountains of Siberia had a dark complexion. The reason that light skin is more common at higher latitudes in modern humans is generally explained by the lack of sunlight in these environments. Humans need sunlight to synthesize vitamin D. Since sunlight is less intense at higher latitudes, light skin is evolved to absorb more sunlight when available. However, Neanderthals and and even early Europeans got a lot of vitamin D from their rich diet. It was only in the past 10,000 years that Europeans actually evolved light skin. The prevalence of light skin in populations in the modern day is generally due to agricultural diets. Due to this, it isn't surprising that many Neanderthals living in Europe would have had relatively dark skin, though not all did. Two different Neanderthal individuals from Italy and Spain both provided fragments of the MC1R sequence. In modern humans, this gene is responsible for light skin and red hair. However, the MC1R gene that the researchers had found was different than the one found in modern humans. In order to test if this gene would have had a similar effect in Neanderthals, they inserted the Neanderthal gene into human pigment cells. The gene produced the same loss of function that gives redheads their unique coloration. The study provided solid evidence that some Neanderthals did indeed have light skin and red hair. The frequency of this phenotype remains unknown. Just as in modern humans, red hair was probably not very common in Neanderthals as it was not present in other sequenced individuals. The phenotype was likely more common in northern regions just as it is today.
Minotaurs undoubtedly had a wide array of skin, hair, and eye colors. Another question regarding their hair is how much body hair did they have? From genetics, it is known that the genes that make modern humans furless date back to around 1.7 million years ago. Since this is well before our last common ancestor with Neanderthals, we know that Neanderthals would have had furless skin. Genetics also corroborate this. Just like us, they still had body hair, but even the hairiest Neanderthals would have not have had actual fur. Anatomically, Neanderthals are fairly similar to modern humans, though their differences cannot be overlooked. Their anatomy was far different than any modern human alive today, even if at the surface we vary so much. Neanderthals used a vast array of technologies to survive their challenging world. Many materials and techniques were used to create a lot with very little. Since stone does not decay like biological matter, thousands upon thousands of Neanderthal stone tools have been recovered. This has allowed us to learn an incredible amount about their lives. To understand these tools, we must first understand the evolution of stone tool technology in general. As mentioned earlier, the first stone tools made by our ancestors were simple hand axes with a few flakes taken off. This simplistic technology is considered Mode 1 by archaeologists. Mode 2 technology, also known as Acheulean technology, would appear with Homo erectus around 1.7 million years ago. Stone cores were worked symmetrically on both sides to create much more refined hand axes. There was not much of a strategy to creating flakes or to utilizing the material effectively. This would change roughly 300,000 years ago with the emergence of Lavalwa technology. The Lavalwa technique, also known as Mode 3 technology, appeared throughout Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa during the appearance of the first anatomically modern humans and some of the earliest Neanderthals. The creation of the technique led independently in various regions, though it is often credited to the Neanderthals. When we first see the classical anatomical forms of Neanderthals, let's say 250,000 years ago, um, they were utilizing uh, a, a middle Paleolithic technology, which is based upon taking a core and striking flakes off the core and then utilizing the flakes um, to do things in terms of whittling wood to make um, spears with which they could um, dispatch animals, mostly by throwing, sometimes by stabbing. Um, this Middle Paleolithic technology of, of cores and flakes is slightly different from what we see in the Lower Paleolithic, which is what we get mostly with the let's say, Homo erectus and Homo heidelbergensis, who was immediately before Homo neanderthalensis, um, who were using hand axes of what we call the Acheulean culture or techno complex. And there they were using a, a hand axe core that in and of itself was actually usable as a, as a sharp implement for cutting for pounding and for butchery. Um, the cores in the middle Paleolithic were not tools in of themselves anymore, but it was the shaping of the flakes with um, particular types of reduction patterns. By, by reduction, meaning literally you're taking flakes of stone off of a core. Um, that characterizes uh, what Neanderthals were doing in that time period. And so we can find objects such as this uh, flint core, which probably originally a nodule of, of, of flint that was subsequently struck with a certain pattern of blows, removing flakes that are then, then uh, utilizable um, for butchery or for working other materials like wood. The technique itself consisted of striking preferential flakes off of prepared lithic cores. The core was shaped in a specific way to create a dome-shaped core known as a tortoise core. A platform was prepared on a high spot, which, when ultimately struck, created a large preferential flake. This flaked nearly the entire underside of the core, effectively utilizing much of the material. Experiments have shown that the Lavalwa core is an economic optimal strategy of raw material usage. It can create the longest cutting edge per weight of raw material. This would have allowed the Neanderthals to be highly mobile, as they could get the most out of their material. The actual Lavalwa flake produced was very sharp on all sides. It would have been very efficient as a butchering tool, 
much more so than a hand axe. Neanderthals still used hand axes, though for more generalized purposes. Hand axes are not the most effective butchering tools because of their often steep edges and limited resharpening potential. Lavalwa flakes, on the other hand, are quite thin and can be retouched easily. Most of the technology that we see with Neanderthals is taking flakes coming off of uh, prepared cores like Lavalwa or discoidal, and then the flakes are immediately utilized, or they might be subsequently resharpened and or their morphology changed by little removals off of a surface such that it makes um, a different shaped edge. When you make these little removals, it makes the edge more acute, so it's not actually sharper, but if the edge has been damaged by use, then by making these little removals, you are resharpening it um, to some extent. And so most of the, the tools that we get in the middle Paleolithic that Neanderthals were using are flake tools, so that meaning that they are uh, not very long uh, relative to their width, and so there's something that would just you would just hold in the hand and utilize um, without a haft, meaning there's no handle. The sharp flake could originally be used as a knife and then later be resharpened into a hive scraper or other tool. With the Lavalwa method, other types of flakes could also be created. By isolating two converging ridges and striking beneath them, a Lavalwa point could be made. These points are unsymmetrical but come with very sharp converging edges. Once hafted, these points could be very deadly weapons. We do know that Neanderthals were hafting tools also, um, particularly uh, points that were made with a, usually the Lavalwa technology that would allow the, the form to take a, um, have convergent edges that comes into a point. This is actually not a, such a classic Lavalwa point, but it's pretty close um, with the two convergent edges. Um, in terms of how it would be hafted, it would be stuck into to a haft like, like this. Um, and we have examples of very crude halves from around 400,000 years ago where they're just shoving into a crack in, in the wood. Otherwise, we have um, evidence that um, from abrasion on the edges and surfaces of the stone that uh, it also forms of glue, uh, a, a natural asphalt that was used to glue stones into a haft that they were hafting things um, in the amp. time period, whether they were doing it for using as knives or for large stabbing spears, um, those are more likely than, let's say, than a true projectile technology. Throwing them would have been also easy, but the, the actual tip area, cross-sectional area of a projectile tip like this, um, tends to be a bit larger than what we would see in a modern human society that using for either a projectile technology like a spear thrower or an atlatl, or even a later technology like a bow and arrow. So these look more like stabbing spears um, than they do something that would fly through the air and really take out an animal at a distance. That's part of the argument that why Neanderthals were so much more muscular in terms of their uh, skeletal structure, in terms of just having thicker cortical bone than moderns, is that they were just engaging in, in much harder uh, life, um, which could have been including you know, confrontations with violent animals that they were trying to kill. The Vatwa points were almost certainly hafted. However, they may have been hafted in a very rudimentary way. We will talk more on this later. This study on 117 Lavalwa points, each points displayed use wear damage. Two of them were used for woodworking activities, six of them are associated with butchery, while one point was distinct from the others. An examination of the point showed a chipped and denticulated left edge. This damage denotes violent penetration into an animal carcass and is consistent with contemporary tests of hafted spear points. Though the study suggests that the points were used as spear points, it also suggests that most weren't. Many of them would have been used for woodworking or for butchery. That looks pretty cool. Nonetheless, this does not diminish the significance of these tools on the tips of spears. 
also remains with impact damage consistent with Lavawa points, as well as fossils with literal Lavawa points embedded in them, confirms the use of this technology in hunting activities. A find like this is extraordinary for the time period. We will talk further about the use of these spears when we discuss how Neanderthals would have hunted. Lawa points were commonly made by Neanderthals, but other types of points were also used. Triangular flakes resulting from less standardized platforms were often utilized. These flakes could be turned into convergent scrapers. As their name suggests, they were primarily used as scrapers, though they may have also functioned as spear points. Austerian points were another point created from triangular flakes or Lavawa flakes. They were modified by taking off additional flakes. This created a more symmetrical point that was often easier to haft. Later Neanderthal points dating to the twilight of their existence were even bifacial and highly refined. Bifacial points from Hohlfels, Germany were made with considerable skill. This point in particular was certainly hafted and used as a spear point. It was resharpened multiple times until it was no longer useful and likely discarded. Though it may look rough now, during its original creation it would have looked similar to this. Another point from a cave in Switzerland preserves a more pristine bifacial point. These points indicate that Neanderthal stone point technology did reach a considerable complexity towards the end of their time. Most, if not all, Neanderthal points were created with the intention of being placed on thrusting spears. The points were just too large to be part of a projectile such as an arrow, atletal dart, or javelin. Their thrusting spears would have likely been very robust and primarily for stabbing. This does not mean that they couldn't have been thrown, though. Some evidence of wounds caused by Lavalwa points suggests that they were used as projectiles. These spears would have likely been thrown at times, but only short distances. With the mass of a robust Lavalwa point and a heavy shaft, these spears would have packed a considerable punch when thrown in close quarters. Though a Neanderthal may have preferred to hold on to their weapon and deliver most of their blows by hand. This is supported by the high rate of Neanderthal injuries, suggesting that they got very close to their prey. As mentioned previously, Lawa points and other Neanderthal points would have been hafted to spears. Another question we must answer is, how were these points actually hafted? Points from earlier periods were left with unground edges. This is important because the sharp edges of a Lavalwa point would cut through any cordage wrapped around them. This suggests that early Lavalwa points were simply placed into a wooden slot with perhaps the aid of an adhesive. Later Lavalwa points, as well as Mausterian and Bifacial points, had ground edges which would have been wrapped with some kind of wrapping or cordage. Strips of leather, plant fiber cordage, sinew, and gut would have all been great materials to hold points in place. Chemical analysis from a Mausterian point and two Lavalwa points from a site in Syria have shown that a natural glue was present on the base. Adhesives such as pine tar, birch tar, and bitumen have all been found at Neanderthal sites. The oldest evidence of adhesive use attributed to Neanderthals comes from two pieces of birch tar that date to around 200,000 years ago. It was once thought that Neanderthals needed a complex container or methods to create birch tar, but a recent study has proven that birch tar could have been made simply by scraping burnt bark off of cobbles. The resulting material is a great adhesive and is quite shock absorbent. An amazing piece of birch tar from Koenigsaat, Germany, preserves imprints of wood, stone, and even a Neanderthal fingerprint. Evidence of hafting couldn't get much better than this. Another quite easily obtained adhesive would be conifer resin, also known as pine sap. It can be used straight from the tree, though it is not very shock resistant. As primitive technology enthusiasts may know, adding beeswax makes it an exceptional glue and Neanderthals knew it too. Residue from ten stone tools from Grotta del Fasolone and Grotta del Santa Agostino contained the chemical signatures of conifer resin and one contained chemicals from beeswax. Other sites containing pine resin and beeswax have strengthened the idea that Neanderthals purposefully mixed these components to create a strong adhesive. 
last adhesive used, bitumen, is a sticky, highly viscous form of petroleum that may have been harvested from natural deposits across Europe. In its natural state, it is sticky and ready to use. Neanderthals from El Cedron Cave in Spain were found to have bitumen in their dental calculus. It has been hypothesized that this may have occurred by using the mouth to aid in the hafting of tools. Perhaps by clamping their teeth down on the haft, holding the lithic in one hand and applying the adhesive with the other. Another form of adhesive that may have been used but we don't have evidence for is hide glue. Hide glue can simply be made by cooking bits of hide or sinew next to a fire with indirect heat. Neanderthals would have likely noticed the adhesive properties of bits of hide or sinew on the meat that they were cooking. The glue produced by this method is quite strong, but more importantly, it binds sinew, gut, and leather together. Hide glue is essentially protein that can that can be used to adhere bindings together. Neanderthals may have used it on their bindings to keep their spear points in place, though we do not have evidence of its use. Still, it is important to consider technology that we do not have direct evidence for. Another important form of evidence for hafting comes from polishes. Hafting a tool with adhesive creates clear signs on the stone. Many artifacts, including points, retouched tools, and even random flakes were hafted. In some sites, nearly half of the artifacts had hafting micro-polishes. Many other sites show that hafting stone tools was quite common in the Neanderthal world. When looking at Neanderthal tool remains, they may appear quite crude and simplistic, but imagining them hafted on various handles and grips sheds light on the complexity of their tools. Another underrepresented aspect of Neanderthal technology were their wooden weapons and tools. Actual projectiles as well as many weapons such as thrusting spears and throwing sticks were made of wood. In terms of the technology involved, um, Neanderthal technology tends to be focused more on using stone to carve wooden objects as implements for but the modern humans in the Upper Paleolithic tended to be tended to half their stone tools more frequently. Wood was worked with a number of stone tools. Lavawa points and blades were efficient tools for shaving wood. Backed knives would have also worked well. Notched tools were effective at shaving wood, while denticulate tools could be used to saw wood. Blades could also be turned into tools called birins. This is a fairly thick blade that was retouched here, so it was probably longer, and the end was, was taken off to make a little platform to then make uh, a burin spall come off here. The burins themselves were actually good little barbs, but the actual scar left on, on the blade, this becomes the burin, and the part that comes off is called the burin spall. This is actually excellent for graving wood, uh, bone and wood, so you can literally shave bone with this edge because it's it's both sharp but also uh, fairly robust and stone is very sharp but it's also very brittle and so if you're trying to work something that's very hard you need a steeper edge and so a burin edge is really very useful for that with their array of woodworking tools they were able to create very refined wooden technology the amazing discovery of the Shonigan spears in 1994 recovered 10 wooden weapons dating to over 300,000 years ago they were the oldest complete wooden tools ever discovered and were either made by early Neanderthals or late Heidelbergensis. Wood degrades in only a few years in most cases, but the rapid sedimentation and waterlogged conditions of the site provided the precise conditions for preservation. The site was once a lake shore that eventually became buried with sediment with the retreat of the Elsterian ice sheet. Spears and other wooden tools were found in direct association with animal remains and stone and bone tools. The wooden tools take a variety of shapes, seemingly designed for different purposes. The spears are between 1.84 to 2.53 meters, or 6 to 8.3 feet in length. The majority of the spears were made from slow-growing spruce trees, while spear 4 was made of pine. 
The points of the spears were carved from the bases of the trees, which are denser. All the spears were tapered on both ends except for spear six. Spear six also has a natural kink. It has been interpreted as a thrusting spear. However, the other spears taper aerodynamically and are weighted with the center of gravity in the front third of the shaft. Their design and weighting suggest that they may have been used as javelins. Contemporary experiments using replicas demonstrated that Spear 2 could be thrown as far as 20 meters or 65 feet. The spear performed similarly to modern javelins. The ones suspected to be javelins also performed well as thrusting weapons. They were likely used in multiple ways. The evidence suggests that some of the spears would have been efficient for throwing while others, especially Spear 6, was made for thrusting. All of them would have been useful for hunting or defending against predators. What is interesting about these spears is not one of them had a hafted point. Though this is not surprising considering the date between 300 and 330,000 years ago. Hafted points would become more frequent in later time periods. In addition to the spears, there were other wooden objects. Double-pointed sticks, 64 centimeters or 2 feet long, are suspected to have been used as throwing sticks. Throwing sticks have been used across many human societies to target small game or to drive large game. The Neanderthals at Schoenigen may have been targeting waterfowl with these weapons. Another wooden tool found at the site was a charred wooden stick that has been interpreted as a skewer for roasting meat. The last wooden objects yet to be mentioned were short work shafts with notches cut into them. They have been inferred as handles for stone tools. They were likely paired with a sharp flake that would act as a knife. Other wooden tools created by Neanderthals exist, though they are very rare. The oldest wooden tool that is either attributed to early Neanderthals or their ancestors is the Clacton Spear. It was discovered off the coast of England and has dated to around 420,000 years ago. Since the spear only consists of a tip, it is unknown if the spear would have been suitable for throwing, though it certainly could have been used for thrusting. The existence of this technology predating the appearance of true Neanderthals and its appearance in Germany a hundred thousand years later suggests that most, if not all, Neanderthals would have used wooden spears. Other Neanderthal wooden objects have been found, including another spear, though their preservation is poor and their purpose is debatable. The site of Abrek Romani preserved the imprints of many wooden objects. Though the wood has long since decayed, the travertine has preserved a cast with incredible detail. A few flat wooden dish-like objects have been found. A large pole, 5 meters or 16 feet long, may have been part of this structure. An impression of a very interesting knife or spade-like object was also found. The object is very unique, as it is not something that we see in contemporary indigenous societies. It may have been used as a butchering tool, or perhaps a digging tool. We will never know for sure. There are a handful of other impressions from wooden tools that are more enigmatic. Overall, the findings at Abrik Romani have taught us that much of the items made and used by Neanderthals would have been wooden. Besides spears and handles, many unique objects would have been made. Though stones have stood the test of time, wooden tools were just as essential to Neanderthal survival. Neanderthals also utilized other materials when creating tools. Bone and shell tools were used, though in limited ways. Bone tools were mostly limited to the soie and flint snapping tools. Hammers often made of animal limb bones were great tools for striking flakes off of cores. Smaller broken bone shards called retouchers are quite common throughout Neanderthal sites. They vary in construction, but Neanderthals generally preferred the bones from the rear limbs of large animals such as aurochs, horse, and bison. Materials such as jaws, horn cores, and mammoth ivory were also utilized. In one case, even another Neanderthal skull fragment was used as a retoucher. These tools would be used to resharpen stone edges by hitting off small flakes. Other bone tools display evidence that they may have even been used for indirect percussion flint snapping. 
This advanced foot mapping technique consists of two tools, a tool contacting the stone core and a tool to hit the other tool. This technique accurately focuses a lot of force into a small point. It is a very effective technique that allows for making much better stone tools. The Shonigan Sight Sharp bones may have functioned as knives to cut flesh. In other sites, mammoth tusks seem to have been split and mapped into scrapers. At one site in Germany, over a dozen bone artifacts dating to over 60,000 years ago have been found, and some of them may have been points. Flattened mammoth ribs with pointed tips may have... With star reviews from you and star prices from us, start your search on Amazon today. May have functioned as spear points. A smaller point made of reindeer antler was almost certainly a spear point. It is light enough that it even could have been hafted on a javelin or a dart. It is possible that a point of this size could have been hafted on an arrowhead, though our evidence does not suggest that Neanderthals ever used this technology. It certainly could have been part of a light throwing spear or possibly even an atlas. This idea is lacking any support, but it is an interesting idea to consider. The appearance of hafted bone points throughout Europe is largely correlated with the appearance of modern humans. But their existence in Neanderthal sites tells us that Neanderthals were certainly aware and capable of this technology to some extent. This technology is only found at one site in Germany, but bone does not always stand the test of time. It is possible that bone points were used elsewhere and left little trace, though we just don't know. Another tool made of bone found at various Neanderthal sites were leatherworking tools called lissois. These tools, also known as slickers or burnishers, are used to rub into hides to make them softer and more water-resistant. Neanderthals chose the ribs of large herbivores to make these tools. Though these lissois could be made with the abundant reindeer from which they hunted, they preferred the more uncommon bison and aurochs ribs. Besides mammal bones, shell was also heavily utilized by various populations of Neanderthals, particularly in the Italian peninsula. In areas of poor quality stone, we see that Neanderthals often used shell as an alternative. Shell is a hard material that can be napped similarly to stone, but can also be resharpened simply by rubbing against an abrasive stone. Over 170 work shell tools were found at Grote de Moscherini alone. Out of these shells, about 24% of them were gathered alive from the sea floor, meaning that Neanderthals had to wade or dive into shallow waters to collect them. These live clams have stronger and more robust shells than unoccupied specimens. They also offered a small snack every time they needed another tool. Across various sites, these tools were used for cutting meat, scraping skins, and even for shaping wood. Shell tools are found in parts of Italy and Greece, but are absent from other Mediterranean sites. Considering that Neanderthals were certainly using aquatic resources elsewhere, it is strange that shell tools are not more common. It is possible that these sites exist, but lie beneath the ocean's surface. The ocean undoubtedly conceals many other facets of Neanderthal life. The use of fire was clearly a major technological development for our genus. Evidence of the use of fire by our ancestors extends more than a million years into prehistory. To understand the significance of this technology, we should take a further look into why exactly it was so advantageous. First and foremost, fire provided heat. Neanderthals lived across a range that was quite often cold depending on the current environmental conditions. Other ways to stay warm existed, such as clothing, but fire provided direct heat. At the site of Abra Cromani, there were eight evenly spaced hearths aligned against the rock shelter wall. These hearths have been interpreted as personal fires to keep individuals warm while sleeping. Similar constructions have been observed by Australian desert aboriginals. They would sleep with little glowing campfires on either side of them. The altering position between each individual and fire provided an economical way to stay warm. Other Neanderthal sites show similar constructions. The advantage of fire, arguably more important than warmth, was its use for cooking. Charred bones that may have been cooked are widely known from many Neanderthal sites. 
This suggests that the meat and marrow were likely being cooked. Other mm -hmm. tissues, such as organ meat, does not preserve well in the fossil record. Cooking mm -hmm. meat breaks down tough fibers and connective tissue, which makes it easier to chew and digest. It also leads to better nutrient absorption and kills any harmful pathogens. Direct evidence for cooking plants is very rare in the Neanderthal fossil record, though it does exist. The Kabara assemblage consists of more than 4,000 charred seeds, which were likely mostly from legumes and nuts. It is possible that these seeds came from dung or from animal carcasses, though their density suggests that they were deposited from direct cooking. The use of fire for cooking is often correlated with the shrinking of our ancestors' large ape gut. The large guts seen in our earlier ancestors were used to digest tough plant fibers and unprocessed meat. To process this food, their gut had to use a lot of energy by itself, meaning this energy was available for things such as large body and brain size. More nutrient-dense food allowed us to have a much smaller gut, which is hypothesized to have led to the development of the large brain sizes seen in hominins such as Neanderthals and modern humans. The presence of many hearths at Neanderthal sites with charred food remains indicates that fire was often used for cooking. Though it should be noted that fire may have not always been available, and raw food would have been eaten. Another important use of fire not realized by many is its increase on human productivity. The light fire provides would have increased the hours which people could craft tools and socialize. Modern humans have about a 16-hour waking period, while other apes are only awake from sunup to sundown, which is around four hours less. Considering many groups of Neanderthals lived in dark caves, the light of fire would have been very useful for many crafts. Wood napping was often done within caves, and fire would have been essential for this. Other tasks like hide working, woodworking, and butchery would have needed light. Socializing is also an overlooked aspect that fire would have allowed. I would venture to say that we have all sat around a fire, captivated by the methodical flames, while talking with friends and family. Neanderthal similarly would have talked about the day's activities, future projects, and possibly old stories of great beasts and even greater hunters. You can only imagine how fascinating it would be to hear one of these conversations with the help of a linguist. Another important question regarding Neanderthal fire use is how they obtained it in the first place. The obvious answer would be naturally occurring wildfires. Wildfires occurring from lightning strikes would have been very well known to Neanderthals living across Eurasia. Fire could be harvested and kept going for weeks, months, and possibly even years with the right planning. The problem with this method is that natural fires are not reliable or necessarily predictable especially in colder seasons. The many Neanderthal sites with evidence of fire has always made researchers wonder if they were able to create it on their own. Direct artifactual evidence for regular systematic fire production has been found at multiple sites across France, according to a 2018 study. Dozens of late Middle Paleolithic bifacial tools exhibit evidence of repeated abrasion with a hard mineral material. The macroscopic and microscopic traces found on the axes are consistent with experimental reconstructions struck with pyrite, also known as marcasite. Striking a flat lithic surface with pyrite creates sparks which can be harvested for fire creation. The evidence suggests that this technology was at least present within southern France, though it may have also been used elsewhere. Even just striking regular flint together can produce sparks, and it is possible that Neanderthals could have gotten a fire started this way. Another study from 2016 found evidence that Neanderthals were using manganese dioxide to help start fires. Scratch marks on blocks of manganese suggest that the substance was being turned into a powder. When this powder is sprinkled over wood, it is shown to lower the ignition temperature of the wood significantly allowing for fires to be started much easier. It is debated if this substance was actually used to start fires because it also could have been used as a black pigment. However, a variety of other materials such as charcoal would have worked perfectly well as black pigment. The careful selection of manganese dioxide and subsequent processing suggests that it may have played an important role in starting fires, at least in southern France. 
Another complicated but important form of evidence that Neanderthals were creating fire comes from the chemistry of ancient hearths. A 2019 study found that the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in the floor sediments from an Armenian cave suggest that fire was being created independently of natural sources. Other fire-making techniques such as friction-made fire must also be considered. Hand drills and fire plows are a very simple construction yet are reliable ways to start a fire. Fortunately, this technology would be very little if not nothing behind archaeologically. Existing evidence suggests that some Neanderthals likely did create their own fires, but it certainly does not mean that the majority did. The evidence of hand axes being struck with a hard mineral and the hydrocarbon evidence